Thank you to the, uh, to the moderator. So um, what I'd like to do today is talk about the diagnosis and management of dysplasia and polyps in UC. And what this topic is really about is really a, a lesson in history. And really to understand where we are now, we have to understand kind of how far we've come from the uh, original diagnosis. So this was the first description of colorectal cancer in IBD from 1925 uh, by Crohn's. And what you see is that it really was a, a case report really describing how um, you know, uh, cancer happened on, on their watch. So this was a patient basically who was observed in the hospital. They had seen the ulcer. They had, this is not somebody who was lost to follow up. And this I think really framed how we thought about dysplasia uh, in IBD for the longest time. Now, since then, we've kind of evolved from this area, this era where essentially there was really not much use of colonoscopy, you know, barium enema, cancer happened, you know, cancer was really a natural history phenomenon. If we move to the area of, uh, era of early colonoscopy, it was really an intriguing thought of kind of doing biopsy surveillance, which was really different from what we do in our normal lives doing colonoscopy, where we actually resect polyps where if you had high-grade dysplasia, they would go to surgery. Low-grade dysplasia, you would either follow them. But there's really no description of polyps. As we move on to the kind of the earlier part of the, of the century or the new, the new century, what we see is that we started talking about IBD and dysplasia similar to what we did in our everyday lives for colonoscopy taking out polyps. All of a sudden, there were studies that came out that showed that polyps can re be removed and patients safely surveyed. Uh, there were now high-definition scopes, so we could actually see more. And then more recently, we started talking about chromoendoscopy. As the techniques of endoscopic mucosal resection became more prevalent, we started uh, talking more about can you resect a polyp. And what we're seeing is really a convergence in the world of UC or IBD dysplasia surveillance and in regular colonoscopy, where we're starting to try to use a similar language and really trying to integrate these two different areas into what we do every day. Because the fact is that as gastroenterologists, there's a lot of expertise in doing colonoscopy and taking out polyps. So I'll discuss a little bit about uh, these, uh, these evolutions and, and where we are today. Okay, so in order to talk about um, dysplasia surveillance, I want to talk about four uh, key parameters. Uh, first of all, what is surveillance uh, colonoscopy, when to do it uh, and when, how to perform it, how to describe dysplasia when found, and I think this is a, an important uh, subtopic for the talk, and then how to manage dysplasia uh, once detected. All right, so who should undergo surveillance and when? So it's important to really define what is a uh, screening or surveillance colonoscopy. So this is really a colonoscopy performed with the intent of performing surveillance or screening. Uh, typically what you want to do is make sure that the disease is at its, its quiescent point, uh, prep is good, and Remember, we often think about this being a, um, you know, we often do uh, IBD surveillance in patients who have active disease. The fact is that unlike, for example, when we do colonoscopy for somebody who has IBS, you can still see that mucosa as well as in the screening colonoscopy. So often we take advantage and do opportunistic surveillance. You see a polyp, you remove it. And although you should do it similarly for a patient who has active disease, often because of inflammation or pseudopolyps, the sensitivity will go down. So what we want to talk about is for screening and surveillance, disease has to be really quiescent, and we're doing it with the intent of screening. Now, where do we see the, the guidelines in terms of uh, when to perform surveillance and uh, the follow-up? So the initial surveillance or screening exam is typically, you see there, depending on the societies, anywhere from eight to 10 years after the disease onset. For the AGA, it's sometimes after the symptoms, and hopefully that discrepancy between diagnosis and symptoms is actually very short, and immediately in primary sclerosis and cholangitis. Now the subsequent surveillance intervals do vary, but you can see that if we had to kind of summarize it, it's basically anywhere from one to three years with different calculations depending on the guidelines. Uh, for example, the, the AGA, if you have uh, several normal screenings, you can extend it out. But the point is that it's anywhere from one to three years. So nowhere are we doing surveillance for somebody up to five years. Now, the British Society guidelines actually has an interesting take as well as ECHO, and where they're actually risk stratifying. So normally, if this, you know, given this talk a while ago, I would have shown all the risk factors for surveillance. And so what the British Society guidelines have done is actually tried to incorporate some of these risk factors into kind of a, a, a low, medium, and large uh, type of uh, follow-up surveillance. Whereas typically you have every year for the patient with pancolitis or early family history of colon cancer, patients who have quiescent disease, almost normal colonoscopy, which many of us have, have scoped, 
uh, where the biopsies, you're not even sure if the patient had ulcerative colitis, there's no pseudopolyps, the colon is not shortened. Those patients are followed up in five years, and everyone else is in three years. So although this is probably the right answer, uh, the fact is that so far for our surveillance guidelines in the U.S., the, the, the extension is up to three years. Now, how to perform uh, surveillance if you're planning to do it? Um, do you need to do random biopsies? You know, do we still need to do the four-quadrant biopsies? What are we going to do? Well, part of what you're doing, you already know. So think about your non-IBD surveillance life when you do colonoscopy. So you want a clean prep. You want to use your eyes, do a very careful exam, look for those flat polyps. Uh, don't ignore su subtle clues, which is a little bit harder in IBD. So the thing that I think about is, you know, you see things are inflamed, you know, look for something that's different than its neighbor. And that should attract your attention as a potentially suspicious lesion. Definitely take your time and repeat, you know, segment by segment, patient after patient, year after year, and that's how you detect more dysplasia. Now, for ulcerative colitis, similar to the New England Journal article many years ago that showed that a slow, that withdrawal time was important, we see that that's also true for IBD surveillance from this Mayo Clinic study. This was 635 IBD patients, and when you see that each minute of withdrawal time, you know, up to a certain point, obviously, uh, actually increased your flat dysplasia uh, detection rate. So again, using clues that you already know is still an important adjunct, besides the extra bells and whistles that I'll talk about for IBD surveillance in a, in a minute. Now, why do we even talk about random biopsies? This was an interesting uh, study I found, and you see the pictures from 1971, you know, really showing how we've evolved in terms of what we can see, how we're describing things. In this uh, nice paper describing this great sigmoidoscope, what you see is that they were very proud that you could examine the entire sigmoid within, 35, uh, within 30 minutes. And then uh, with the biopsies, they said that often the biopsies, because they were small, you often, it was kind of hard to get enough tissue, so you actually had to take multiple biopsies for flat dysplasia. So again, this is part of the history that we evolved from these flat, poly, flat dysplasia or, or random biopsies uh, in IBD. But the fact is that in 2017, what we're really talking about is, can you detect subtle things? So these are actually uh, an IBD patient and a non-IBD patient. This is a true story, basically back to back. And what you see here is two kind of subtle lesions in the cecum. Same technique, basically same eyes, same uh, uh, methodical looking. And what you see there was a flat lesion. It puts a methylene blue. You can actually see it more, and you can see it there as well. So the question is, how do we find that polyp? Is it the slow withdrawal? Is it making sure the colon, is, the, the prep is clean? Is it adding a dye spray? Is it actually taking random biopsies? And so the fact is that probably the key part here was actually the slow exam and just really trying to see something and then using perhaps methylene blue or something else to really identify it. Now again, what we see is that we've evolved over time. So this was actually an interesting um, review from the 1990s that basically said that, declared that 95% of, of dysplasia in IBD was flat and rarely was it visible. And you can see there's a nodularity and a thickening. And what you see is more recent studies, and this is actually, you know, these were in the, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, which means it was during the endoscopy time from the 1990s. What you see is that that rate kind of came down to about 25%, where biopsies were found with, um, uh, that, that flat dysplasia was found in terms of invisible dysplasia. And I imagine that over time, that number has even gone down even more. Now, how do we detect those, subtle, those more subtle lesions? Well, one is chromoendoscopy. So chromoendoscopy is different from virtual chromoendoscopy in that chromoendoscopy is the application of a dye spray, either indigo carmine or methylene blue, onto the mucosa of the colon. And what you see here is that there's about a two to five-fold increased risk, a couple percentage increased risk of dysplasia. And so what I'll talk about now is uh, some of the finer points of chromoendoscopy, including a video. Now, how many people here have tried or have performed chromoendoscopy? Let's see a show of hands. Okay, uh, a, a, a decent, about half or so. So you may have actually come across this, and if you could play the, the video, where what I've done is that I've actually condensed about a minute and 15 seconds of chromoendoscopy time into 20 seconds. And what you can see, this is about a minute and 15 seconds of a completely useless time. You know, cleaning, looking, trying to figure it out. And so this is actually, you, you may have come across this where you just feel like you're, you're drowning in a pool of, of blue. And so one of the things to do there is use a more dilute spray, sometimes using a spray catheter. These are all techniques to really um, try, to, try to make that process a lot easier. But now you've also may have seen that when it does work, it does quite work quite incredibly well. If you could play the video. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you can see here this is a cecum. You can see if you can detect the lesions or not. I know it may be difficult with the lights. And this is with the Pentex scope. So we're using virtual chromoendoscopy with the eye scan, which again has not really been found to improve dysplasia detection. It's really the application of the dye spray. All right, so just kind of showing it to you in real time instead of just the, the pretty picture. You can see we're. And you can see not only do you see that lesion, but many more. And so what you see is that what, what chromoendoscopy does is it helps your eyes distinguish um, contours. And what you can see here is you can see a lot more than you did originally. And you may actually see this lesion, I kind of put it in slow motion, I don't have a pointer, but you may see that lesion right on the fold, but did you see the lesion right next to it? So you saw that one, but how about the one right next to it, right there? All right. Now clearly you're, and we can move on. So clearly the, whether you think chromoendoscopy works great or not is going to depend on picking the right patient. So you do more of the patients where you think polyps will be found uh, versus not. This is a review paper and I'll just go through it very briefly in terms of how to perform chromoendoscopy. It's a very nice review if you haven't read it. Um, and basically it, it shows you that, you know, you need a clean colon. Um, you want to apply the water irrigation. There they have the concentrations of indigo carmine or methylene blue, which are the two types of, of, uh, of dye sprays. Uh, and typically the technique is you can decide whether to use the foot pump or the uh, spray catheter. And the way that the original trials were done is that you go in with white light, you pull back as you're looking, looking with white light and applying the dye spray, uh, and then coming back cleaning up and then doing another look. Um, sometimes people will actually go in with the pump from the beginning to use less uh, 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 dye spray uh, and it'll also make it more efficient. And so right now what we're in the process of doing is trying to make this uh, a slightly less cumbersome process. But again, uh, most of the guidelines do recommend uh, doing it. So you see here, this is basically from some of the major society guidelines, the AGA guidelines from 2010. Really talks about chromoendoscopy as an option. Uh, the scenic uh, consensus statement. Uh, talks about uh, using high definition scopes if you're going to do it, and chromoendoscopy is suggested uh, over white light uh, colonoscopy. Uh, but there's really no discussion about the random biopsies. And the ASGE guidelines, I think, are the most complete, where they're actually very helpful in saying that chromoendoscopy uh, is a preferred modality. You can completely abandon the random biopsies, and we can talk about what would be the proper uh, training for that. Um, but still leaves chromoendoscopy, uh, leaves random biopsies and regular colonoscopy as an option if there's a lot of inflammation, there's not an adequate prep, uh, or if there's not the expertise that's available. Now, where we don't have the um, thing I think which convinces the gastroenterologist, so 100% of the room is here, is really that, well, if I'm supposed to do a better exam and I, you know, I, it's better than the other colonoscopy that I'm doing. Where's the value added? So if I'm still doing a high value exam, I found it's normal, and I'm repeating it again in one year with the extra time, there doesn't seem to be a lot of extra value added if that colonoscopy, for example, is normal. So I'm hoping that where we'll follow from here is that be able to show that a normal colonoscopy with chromoendoscopy will allow us to extend out the intervals. And then I think really, I think at that point, we would see 100% of the room here raise their hands. Also, there are tri uh, trials looking at um, uh, kind of chromoendoscopy pills essentially to kind of uh, uh, mark the, uh, the, the mucosa already and I think that will also uh, improve the technique. All right, so how to describe dysplasia once it's found. And again, this is probably another area that I would encourage you to incorporate into your endoscopy report and really start to, it's, it's closer to what you're doing in your everyday life uh, in patients without IBD. So on the left, this was actually a very nice review from uh, over a decade ago that really talked about how to describe dysplasia in IBD. And this is really you get into the concepts of the adenoma-like mass or the ALM or the DOM, the dysplasia-associated lesion or mass. And what I'd like to show you on the right is, uh, you know, uh, this is, came out of the scenic uh, recommendations, really to try to use language that's similar to what we're doing in the everyday life. And I'll say that at the very top, you're already using uh, in polypoid dysplasia, and remember that a tubular adenoma is low-grade dysplasia. It's the same thing histologically. The pathologist can't tell the difference. You can see there that you're already using the words such as a pedunculated polyp or a sessile polyp. So now really what we need to do is incorporate into the language of non-polypoid dysplasia, which is some, you know, you can consider that as the flat 
uh, dysplasia. So in other words, something that you can see, but you can see they're using the uh, biopsy forceps. It's basically uh, half the size of a closed biopsy forcep, but you can actually see it. And now we also can say in the past where we talked about flat dysplasia where it wasn't clear if it was, if you could see it or not see it, the concept of invisible dysplasia. So to kind of make it easy, what I would say is if you see dysplasia in your endoscopy uh, or any abnormal lesion, it's pedunculated, it's sessile, it's non-polypoid. I would kind of condense those three uh, just simply as non-polypoid, so smaller than the, than the size of, a, of, a, of the half the closed biopsy forceps, or invisible if it was truly on a random biopsy and you didn't see anything. Now, what to do with dysplasia once found? And again, this is where we've evolved over time. Um, and this is kind of from the scenic uh, uh, recommendations. And so you can see that for a lesion that is uh, discrete, that's either polypoid or sessile, if, think about what you do in your everyday life uh, in, 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 without patients with IBD. If you can see it and you can remove it, you can follow that patient. Now, for the non-polypoid dysplasia, again, these are different types of lesions. Some of them are a little bit easier to remove and some of them are not. So you can assess, again, is it discrete? Can I see it? And if you feel like you can remove it, you can attempt to remove it. If it's a complex lesion, similar to the patient without IBD, you may not be able to remove it, but your colleague who does endoscopic mucosal resection or advanced endoscopy may be able to do it. Now, where the guidelines did not really, uh, or these recommendations did not really uh, go into detail, is the, what was called flat dysplasia before, which now we're calling invisible dysplasia. That, that was detected on the random biopsy, which is kind of a surprise when you get it, like, wow, this shows dysplasia. So what I do is I revert back to the 2010 guidelines that Dr. Ferre uh, helped to craft, where um, it's really indeterminate you know, whether that, those patients should go to surgery or not. At least that was the recommendation. What I, I would say is the most important thing is to define whether something is endoscopically resectable, where the margins are clearly identified. You looks like you, you remove the lesions, you wash things off, it, you feel like you've removed it. The endoscopic exam is, co is consistent with complete removal and the biopsies from the adjacent mucosa are free of dysplasia. I will say for the simple lesions, I don't really do this, but for the more complex lesions, it is probably a good idea. Now, it's still important to get a second opinion to confirm a diagnosis of dysplasia in IBD. So this is basically the, the literature that kind of led to the kind of that indefinite dysplasia, um, the indefinite recommendation as to whether with patients who have low-grade dysplasia on random biopsies should undergo surgery. Because what you can see is that uh, in the top, you have a high rate of progression. In the bottom, um, you have a lower rate of progression. And the, the issue here is that um, which one do you believe? So there was a study that was done by Van Shake where basically what they did is that they got all the dysplasia and what they saw is that, that if you kind of took it at the original reading of the, of the dysplasia diagnosis, that those patients basically had a low, grade, low, low rate of dysplasia uh, progression. And so you would think like, okay, we can follow these patients. But they reread all of those kind of with modern pathologists, with a group of, 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 uh, of pathologists, and what they found is that most of those things that were called low-grade dysplasia actually disappeared very few of them, and those that were called low-grade dysplasia kind of in the modern times actually had a higher rate for progression. So those patients with a random biopsy, I recommend doing chromoendoscopy. If you can see the lesion, you can try to see if you can remove it or not, or a colleague, and if you can't, typically those patients I send for a proctocolectomy. So basically, how do we manage uh, dysplasia and IBD? So the first screening you should do eight to 10 years after the onset of symptoms, immediately in uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Chromoendoscopy is really the preferred uh, modality, although there are still a lot of questions and debate around it, particularly what is the value added, but it is a technique that I recommend that you uh, attempt to learn, but even if you're not doing it, doing a good high quality exam using your eyes is probably going to get you 95% of the way there. I would recommend abandoning the use of ALM and DOM in favor of nomenclature that you're already using in patients without um, IBD. Uh, and finally, that uh, base management of dysplasia on the endoscopic description. And so by using these descriptions, it makes it a lot more obvious, in my opinion, in terms of what you need to do. So with that, thank you very much for your time.